You're listening to a podcast from 702 and Cape Talk. 702 and Cape Talk. The Naked Scientist. It is that time, the Naked Scientist, of course, 9.35. We take your calls on 011-883-0702 and 021-446-0567. What would you like to know? Chris, good morning to you. Good morning. I hope you are well. Well, I'm, I'm good to middling, I'd say. <laughs> right. A couple of questions that we do have, uh, SMSs we'll look at as well. Let's just get straight to it. Um, Sando in Jerskay Park, good morning. Good morning. Um, can I start asking? Yeah, go ahead. Chris is listening. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I just want, want to know how we humans generate all this heat in our body. So we are 36 degrees all the time. How is it happening and how can we control it? And if it goes up 38, 39, what's the cause of this? Mm-hmm. Well, good morning. The answer is that we're warm-blooded, and the reason we're warm-blooded is down to our metabolism. It's all chemistry or biochemistry. The food that you eat and the average person takes in something like two to two and a half thousand calories of energy a day, that equates to about eight million joules of energy every day. This is broken down in your intestines the components of the food are distributed around your body and cells then burn almost almost the same way that a fire burns in the grate cells are burning that energy they are dismantling some of these chemicals and making new chemicals new chemical bonds particularly uh, from carbon sources to make carbon dioxide which is the stuff you breathe out and when you make chemical bonds you release energy and the energy is heat so the process of metabolism releases free energy and this keeps you as a warm bag of water at about 37 degrees or so why do we sometimes run a temperature well the metabolism metabolic rate is controlled by your brain you have a region at the bottom of your brain called the hypothalamus which is concerned with controlling all of your uh, I suppose animal functions it keeps your heart beating at the right rate it keeps your blood pressure at the right sort of level it keeps the level of acidity and alkalinity in the blood correct keeps you breathing correctly the hypothalamus also sets your body temperature and it does that by controlling your metabolic rate and in response to various stimuli which often include uh, things like infection these release various factors into the bloodstream which the hypothalamus is sensitive to and when it sees those chemicals in the bloodstream it knows there must be an infection on board what it does is then turn up the thermostat it drives your metabolic rate a bit harder it also cuts down the rate at which your body loses heat because your body controls temperature by shunting blood closer to or further from your peripheries and the surface of the skin to either ex- reduce or accelerate the rate of um, heat loss and in this way you shift the equation slightly towards a warmer body and this pushes body temperature up and it's regarded as disadvantageous to the infecting microorganism to have a hotter body and there are some viruses that indeed are very very encumbered when you put body temperature up they won't grow as well all right thank you very much i hope sando is happy there chris we do have our science story of the week a story of how uk scientists um uh, you know how one of the first complex life forms on earth was reproduced and this has been unearthed by the the scientists uh, chicken or egg what's the story here Yes, this is a paper which is by a lady called Emily Mitchell, who's a researcher at Cambridge University, and she has been looking at some of the first complex life on Earth. Now, the Earth is about four and a half billion years old, and life got started on Earth pretty quickly after the Earth formed, by about 3.9 billion years old, or sorry, by about 3.9 billion years ago, so only about half a billion years, give or take, after the Earth first formed. We've got evidence that probably life had already started here. It was primitive life, very simple microorganisms, and it stayed that way for a very long time. In fact, it was only until about 600 million years ago that uh, we think complex life in in the form of multicellular life, where instead of individual single-celled microbes hanging around, you actually got cells getting together to make complicated things like us. That didn't start until very, very recently, really. But obviously that begs the question, once you've got complicated life how would it have reproduced itself? And there is this beautiful example of, or a tantalising example of life reproducing from these researchers at Cambridge University who have been to Canada, and there's part of Canada in Newfoundland, where there is a patch of seafloor beautifully preserved from 565 million years ago, an era called the Ediacaran. And on this 
sample of seafloor, there are these fascinating fossils. And the, the fossils are of a creature called fact, Fractifusus. And it's a bit weird. It looks a bit like a cross between a slug that's been flattened and a fern. Hmm. And uh, it, as far as we know, it didn't have any ability to move, so it would have grown rooted quite literally to the spot. It would have laid flat on the seafloor and it didn't have a mouth, so it would have absorbed all of the nutrients it needed from the water around it. But the big question is, well, if it couldn't move and it just sort of laid there on the bottom of the sea, how on earth did it reproduce itself? And what this group did was to go and make very careful measurements with a, a process of GPS, a bit like the GPS you have in your car, but, but much more precise and accurate. And they were mapping out the relationships between the fossils they had, because in this patch of seafloor, there is a huge number of these fossils in a big community. And what they've been able to find is that there are two things going on. The, there are big ones of these fossils, they're like the grandparent, and very closely adjacent to them are smaller ones, and adjacent to the smaller ones are smaller ones still. And what they think is going on is that these animals were reproducing by putting out what they dub a stolon. It's like a runner from a strawberry plant mm. or a spider plant. The runner comes out and it plants a new clone of the animal, which is effectively genetically identical to its parent, in the area next door. And so you get these little communities growing up of these genetically identical animals. But then if you look, well, where are the big ones located, the grandparents, if you like, they're over a much bigger area and much more randomly distributed. And so the researchers think there's another mode of reproduction going on, which is that the animals can also release what they call a propagule. And they're using this word carefully because they don't know if, the, if these animals are reproducing sexually like we do mm -hmm. or if they're capable of just releasing a, a part of themselves or a spore or something. And this floats off on the tide, settles somewhere where it looks like a nice place to grow and starts a new community over there. So it looks like even 565 million years ago, these very primitive first complex life creatures had already two ways to reproduce themselves, which is incredible to think that this is all preserved in some piece of rock, which is so old as that. All right. Most fascinating. Uh, Chris, thank you very much for, for that. And we'll continue to take your calls on 011 883 0702 and 021-446-0567. Tony in Crystal Park, good morning. You've got a question for Chris. Morning, Koketo. Yeah, I just want to find out from the naked scientist. Um, I had a cell phone uh, falling into a jar of water, and immediately thereafter, the speaker wasn't working. And uh, a friend of mine told me to put it into a jar of rice overnight. I did that, and the following day, the phone was working. I just want to know what is it in rice that is capable of fixing. The speakers of a phone. <laughs> yeah, uh, I've, I've heard yeah. that before. I've heard that uh, before. Yeah, I've always yeah. considered it to be a myth. Uh, Chris, your take on it? Rice-based resuscitation <laughs> yeah. for a mobile phone anyway. <laughs> well, the answer is that probably the rice is very dry, the phone is very wet, and the the way that physics works is that if you have a lot of something in one place then it tries to spread out so it goes to a place where there's less of it and the rice effectively is creating i think probably a gradient and it's helping to draw the water out of the phone there's a number of reasons why water is going to cause your phone to malfunction one of them is that water when it's got a little bit of salt in it at least is capable of conducting electricity really rather well and therefore it's probably going to short out components of the phone and mm. speakers use a relatively high voltage compared with other components in the phone and the contacts may therefore have been shorting out secondly the speaker membrane is it's a flat sheet of material which moves in and out powered usually by a magnetic field and it moves air to make waves in the air and those are the sound waves that you can hear well if you end up with a load of water on the speaker because those speakers are relatively small in compact mobile phones then a, a small amount of water adds a considerable amount of weight onto the speaker membrane and will therefore affect the dynamics of the speaker membrane and make it stop working properly because it won't be able to move mm. because it's trying to generate the wrong forces to move that much mass of water which is stuck on it so i think there are probably those two reasons why the phone didn't work when it was wet you put it in something like rice the dry rice draws the water out of the phone and therefore you your phone is happy again very interesting one there. Thanks a lot, Tony, for your call. Muzi in Joburg, CBD. Good morning. Um, my question is, uh, you know the flask where you 
put in your tea and your your your, your water, it doesn't release steam, but uh, it keeps water inside and it doesn't it doesn't explode or anything due to steam. Unlike if you put hot water in any other um, uh, uh, mm, thing, that you can you can, you can con- any other container that you can just close it tightly. I just want to know how that uh, happens. All right, thanks, Muzi. When you've got a vacuum flask, they usually have a number of factors to them. And what normally is the structure is that you have a glass vessel, which is a layer of glass which is silvered because silver reflects light and heat is infrared. That's a form of light. And so you're reflecting the energy back into the drink. You then have the glass suspended in a vacuum before you have another layer of glass and or something around it, and then the outside of the flask. And this works because in order for heat to move anywhere, heat is energy, it either has to move by radiation, and that's what the silver is for, it moves by conduction, and that means it's got to be in contact with things. So if you have a vacuum, there's nothing to conduct the heat through, Mm. so that stops the heat getting through. Or convection, which is where you give energy to some particles, they whiz around faster, become less dense, and they, they move. Well... If you're in a closed space inside the flask, the convection's not going to do anything either. If you put the hot water into the flask, therefore, it doesn't gain any more energy as soon as you put the hot water into the flask, but you're slowing down the rate at which it loses energy, which is why your drink stays hotter for longer. Mm. But the reason that it doesn't make any more steam is that in order to go from a liquid to a gas steam, you have to supply energy. And at random the water will give some of the particles enough energy to turn into some steam, which is why your cup of hot tea is making steam. It's not that it's making more energy, it's just that the energy that's already in the water in the cup, randomly, occasionally, you have enough of the energy getting into some of the water particles to make those ones have the energy to break away from the liquid and form steam. But when you put the cap on your flask, you're not supplying any more energy to the drink. The Uh, some of the liquid inside the flask will therefore form some steam but the steam will also then condense back into a liquid and run back into the drink the pressure won't continue to rise inside the flask because the rate at which you're making steam is also going to be balanced by the rate at which the steam is condensing back into liquid so it's all in a balanced equilibrium you're just slowing down the rate at which the drink loses energy so therefore you're keeping it hotter for longer Mm. Thanks a lot for that Um, Rohan in Hermanus thanks for your patience, good morning uh, good morning, Pogetso. Uh, my question is, when an airplane flies in a straight line, why does it not gain height because of the curvature of the Earth? I'll listen on the radio. Thank you. Well, when the airplane is flying along, um, it's not flying uh, continuously away from the Earth. It's actually flying along parallel to the Earth because the forces which are actually trying to pull the aeroplane down is gravity, which, as you fly around the Earth, um, then the gravity is pulling the aeroplane down towards the surface equally in, uh, in all downwards directions. So, therefore, it's always going to feel that force downwards. As it flies higher, it's going to uh, become less efficient at flying any higher, and that's why there's a notional maximum amount of um, altitude you're going to get to in your aeroplane because the lift will, be- will become less. So for a given amount of thrust, you generate a given amount of lift, which is just the right amount to compensate for the uh, pull of gravity, and therefore it will reach an equilibrium flying height. And and then you tweak that with a little bit of uh, pilot input or autopilot input in order to make sure that uh, various local factors like wind currents and um, thermals and so on uh, don't throw it off too much. Thank you very much. Michael in Rodopod, you've got a question for Chris. Hi, morning, Chris. Um, I've got uh, two questions. What causes a uh, one to lose consciousness um, if if the cabin pressure is lost in the plane? And secondly, how come they have, they are based to this, they have been recorded to, to fly on the lower levels of the stratosphere, but they survive? What's their difference from us? Thank you. Can you can you just say the last little bit again about the stratosphere bit? I didn't catch that. I, I, um, what I said is that they are based that have been recorded to have flown on the lower levels of the stratosphere and survive. Right, birds that now, have flown um, in the lower levels of the stratosphere and they've survived. Okay, yeah, yeah. No, I, un- I understand. That's a very good question. So first of all, why do humans lose consciousness when uh, the aeroplane you're travelling in suddenly loses pressure? Well, the reason for this is that the 
pressure of oxygen, when you're at ground level, the partial pressure of oxygen makes up about 20% of the air. The pressure of the atmosphere means that there's a, a strong push of oxygen from the atmosphere when you breathe it into your lungs to go into your bloodstream because there's high pressure of air therefore a lot of oxygen molecules are going into your lungs and coming into contact with your blood when you get in an aeroplane they pressurize the cabin to about the equivalent of seven or eight thousand feet which is a happy compromise because most people won't get any symptoms of being at seven or eight thousand feet um but but if you were to suddenly ascends to 39,000 feet or thereabouts, the amount of oxygen in the, in the atmosphere is still 20%. It's still making up about a fifth of all of the gas in the atmosphere, but the pressure of the atmosphere is much, much less. So in other words, in any given volume of space, there is very, very f many fewer atoms or molecules of gas. And this means that the numbers, when you take a lung full of air, the gas correspondingly takes up a lot more space because the pressure is lower. So the number of molecules of oxygen coming into contact with your blood is really low. So there's therefore not the same push of oxygen into the bloodstream. And for that reason, your blood has a much lower total oxygen content and therefore the amount of oxygen being given to your brain is much, much lower. And your brain is probably your most metabolically hungry organ it burns off about 20 plus percent of the oxygen that you consume in any given time. And if you deprive the brain of oxygen input without the opportunity for it to adapt, then it suddenly suffers an energy failure because it's using that oxygen to release energy from the food you've been eating to run your brain and therefore you lose consciousness. So how do either climbers who go up Everest or birds that fly over the Himalayas, there are geese that fly over the top of the Himalayas, so they're flying higher than commercial airlines do fly at, how on earth do they manage that? Well, the answer is they acclimatise on the one hand, um, and birds also have other adaptations that make it possible. But if you go up gently and slowly, so unlike the aeroplane suddenly decompressing, if you ascend from ground level through a series of stages, the human body acclimatizes or adapts to lower levels of oxygen so that it becomes much better at picking oxygen up from the atmosphere even though there's less oxygen there. It also becomes much better at releasing oxygen into the tissue um, because various chemicals are made in the tissue to release the oxygen from your blood. And you also adjust your blood biochemistry to compensate for the fact that you begin to breathe a lot harder. So all those factors come into play, making it possible for people and birds to fly at considerable altitude, whereas unacclimatized, if you suddenly went to that altitude, you would lose consciousness very abruptly. All right. I hope you um, are happy there with that answer. Rory in Bryanston, you've got a question for the Naked Scientist. Yes, hi there. Hi there. Um, if, you, uh, if you do any sort of road cycling, um, it's, it's quite common knowledge that if you, if you ride in a, in a line, uh, there's an advantage to all the people behind the lead cyclists in, in, in terms of wind, uh, wind resistance and drafting. My question is, is there any advantage to the lead cyclist of having people following him? I, I believe there is, but I don't understand why. Hi, Rory. Well, the, the evidence is that when you're cycling along, you are hitting air that's, that's relatively organised, let's say. And as you go through it, you create turbulence and disorder, and the air also grabs some of your momentum and is pulled along behind you. This means that the air is bunching up in front of you, and there is less air behind you, so the pressure behind you is lower. Someone who is coming along behind you can therefore sit in that void, that lower pressure space, and because the air behind them is going to be at slightly higher pressure than the air behind you, if they sit in that space, then they're going to get a bit of a pull towards the back of you or a push from behind to help them to go along. They're not pushing as much air out of the way as you had to, so they get an advantage. And I was just talking about the geese that fly over the Himalayas. Geese and, and other birds do this as well. They will sit in the slipstream of each other because by flying through that dirtier air at lower pressure, it gives you a boost where you're not having to burn off so much energy. And the birds actually use this to their advantage. They swap places. They take it in turns to be the lead and then everyone else gets the slightly freeloading hitchhiking ride at lower output behind the leader, and they take it in turns to give everyone rest.
Uh, I'm not aware that there'll be a huge bonus to the lead cyclist, but of course if you've got someone sitting behind you pushing more air out of the way, then there, then there might be something of an advantage because then the void of lower pressure is behind the person behind you, which might give you a, a bit of an advantage, but probably not as much as the person who's actually sitting in that hole that you're pushing out of the way. So you're very generously doing more work than they have to. All right. Um, Chris, there's a couple of SMSs here, questions via SMS. One saying, if someone is shot in the upper leg and the bullet hits the artery, they bleed out within seconds. How then is it when someone loses a leg from above the knee, they can amputate and not bleed out? Right. Well, there's still a very high likelihood that when a person suffers major trauma, and when a bullet goes through you, it's not so much the bullet tearing through the tissue, but the huge shock wave that goes through the tissue because the bullet compresses the tissue and puts a massive pressure wave through and rips things apart. That, that catastrophe can open up very big arteries and you will literally hose out blood very, very quickly. But if you are promptly able to staunch the flow of blood and that means applying a lot of pressure under certain circumstances, putting a tourniquet on, because tourniquets have come back into fashion in medicine, above the area where it's bleeding, and you can slow down the bleeding and then you keep the person's circulation propped up so that the rest of their body is supplied while you get help, then there's a good likelihood that they will survive. And then what a surgeon needs to do, you need a surgeon. Under these circumstances, you have to have a surgeon, and they've got to go in there and they've got to identify the bleeding vessel and clip it off and stitch it closed. And... uh, and, and that means that um, then you should be able to staunch any further bleeding. But at the end of the day, the more blood a person loses, the more chances they have of dying. And once you lose more than about 20% of your circulating volume, so about 2 litres of your 5 litres of blood, then you're into really, really big danger territory. So whatever the injury, if that happens, then you, you need some medical help very quickly. All right. Um, uh, quickly, Brian, with no time left, a quick question to Chris. Hi, I want to know what causes corrugations on a dirt road. Hello, Brian. Well, the reason for this is the shock absorbers in vehicles. And when the vehicles go along the road, then the vehicle has springs on each of the wheels, and if it hits a little bump, then the vehicle will go up and down on its shock absorbers, and the shock absorbers damp the motion upwards and downwards over a certain period of time. And this means that as the vehicle moves a bit further down the road, because in some places it's going up on its springs, and then a bit moment later it's coming down again, you will get these bumps beginning to build mm. where the vehicle has rocked and bounced up and down after it hit the pothole in the road. When the next one comes along, it then hits the same pothole and does the same thing. Then it starts hitting the bumps that the previous car made, and again, the car is oscillating up and down. And because all the springs that we've got on our vehicles are pretty similar from one vehicle to the next, the, the amount of time it takes the vehicle to rock up and down and bounce like that is the same, and slowly you build these little heaps of of sand in the road which are the corrugations and uh, this is very very common in places like australia and south africa and i was driving across the outback of um, northwestern australia two years ago and uh, i actually did my own little experiment because these corrugations are very very tough when you hit them they make your car shake to pieces but if you drive a little bit faster so that you're hitting them and then the phase of your car trying to bounce up and down is out of phase with where the corrugations are it's almost like they're not there Unfortunately, we are out of time. Chris, thank you very much once again for making time. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. That is the Naked Scientist.